Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and this week, friendship and all of its complications. Every episode, you get a new pair of feminists to talk about the thing we can't get off our minds. And today, you've got me, Susan Matthews, executive editor of Slate, and later in the show, Lane Moore, who is a comedian, actor, musician, and writer of multiple books. Most recently, you will find your people how to make meaningful relationships as an adult. This is a book that is all about friendships, what can go right, what can go wrong, and how to make them work for you. I immediately wanted to read this book when I heard it was coming out for a few different reasons. I think first that as I've grown older, I've gotten strangely like more self-conscious about my friendships and the state of my friendships. It's something that I think about a lot. It's like not as easy when you're past the school years to really maintain and cultivate meaningful relationships. And I think that that really hit me a couple years ago when I moved out of New York City, where I had lived for uh, more than a decade And all of a sudden was in a totally new place, kind of without my friends. This happened to me six months before the pandemic started. So there was a lot more loneliness and friendship searching and contemplating of all these issues in the years that followed. But for me, I think that while that time was pretty isolating for many of us, it really forced me to take stock of my friendships and connections and what I wanted out of them and how I wanted to make sure that they kept growing in a whole new way. I have since moved back to New York City and I'm back near so many of my friends, but I still think that what this book made me realize is that friendship requires the same deliberate action that romantic relationships often require to make sure that it's set up to really serve both people. So I'm so excited to talk with Lane Moore about how she came to this subject and what she learned working on this project. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll come back to that full conversation in just a moment. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Lane, welcome to The Waves. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I loved this book. It was a book that as soon as I saw the title, I knew I needed to read. How did you come to this book? Where did the idea come from? And how did it come to be? You know, I I feel like I can't talk about the second book without talking about the first book because they're so connected. So my first book was called How to Be Alone If You Want to and Even If You Don't. And It's so funny now that this book is out and I'm talking about it that I'm realizing how much the books really are bookends because this one is you will find your people (laughs) how to make meaningful friendships as an adult. So my background is, is, of course, as a comedian and writing about relationships and all these things. But underneath that in my work, I really wanted to write about I raised myself. I grew up very much alone, moved through the world on my own for, for my whole life and um, I didn't really see that reflected. I didn't see anybody really talking about that. And so I felt like it was just me who was, you know, doing that work. And even if somebody didn't come from that kind of extreme, just that feeling of not having the perfect family, not having the perfect friends, not having the perfect partner yet. And so when I wrote How to Be Alone, it was really this book about all of those things and navigating what it means to not have those things and the shame that can kind of come out of that, but also the really deep relationship with yourself that you can cultivate because you're like, well, if it's just me for the rest of my life, you know, I'm my only constant. How can I find strength in that? How can I become a better friend to myself? How can I actually cultivate self-esteem and self-worth and a real love for myself. And then, of course, once you do all that work, once I did all that work on myself, you're going to want to find your people. You're going to want to say, you know what? I've been hurt a lot. Maybe I'm a little bit terrified of people. Maybe I don't know how to do this, but I want to have better friendships. I want to make some new friends. I want to 
get to meet people as I am as a full grown adult, not meeting friends the way that I would have as a teenager or even in college, but meeting them now. And as I started doing that, I was like, wow, (laughs) this is its own level of challenging. And we don't talk about that enough. There's this idea that everybody met all of their friends when they were 16 or 20 years old or something, and then you're just solved for the rest of your life. And that is not my experience. And I really wanted to write a book about what it's like when you get into adulthood and you leave high school and college and you're like, wow, I really don't have the friends that I thought I would have by now, the friends I dreamed of having right now, and write a book about how do you get that? How do you process that? How do we look at people who don't have that yet? I thought that one of the things that really struck me about the book, and it's it's right there in the subhead, How to Make Meaningful Friendships as an Adult, is that like, I do think that we talk a lot about friendship in childhood. And like our concept of of friendship is in many ways very stuck in childhood. It's like your school friends and then you have your college friends. It feels like such a built in like by the phases of your life. You're supposed to just like pick up these people and then keep them with you. What do you think makes adult friendships particularly tricky? One of the things that I think is so hard is so few of us have time. You know, one of the things that I really wanted to talk about in the book is how much in our, in our, many of our parents' generation and grandparents' generation, they had so much more time. They actually were working that alleged 40 hour work week. You know, they they really were working nine to five. Many of us are working like 70, 80 hours. We're working multiple jobs to get by. And you know, not everybody is able to have this sort of like leisure time. And I know I feel that pressure. I know so many of my friends feel that pressure where we want to see each other all the time like they do on Sex and the City. We wish we could all live together like on Living Single. We wish we all lived together next door, you know, like, but that's just, I feel like increasingly harder and harder. And so then you do this thing. I know I do with my friends where I'm like, oh my God, hope to see you in the next few months. Hope you're doing okay. And then you're like, this is trash. Even the people you do connect with, how do you find the time? And then you have all these other things of, you know, maybe someone's going through mental health challenges. Maybe they're really burnt out. Maybe people don't have the energy or the ability to show up for each other as much as we want. That level of like burnout, especially after the last couple of years that like can make it really challenging to show up for each other. Making a meaningful friendship as an adult means making a friendship from the place of like where you found yourself once you've like done that work on yourself. And so deciding like, wait, 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 all these things that are kind of lingering here and feel like obligations. What if I take stock of whether or not they're serving me and whether or not they're serving the other people? Because I thought that another thing that you really shed a lot of light on is that there is only one real vision of like what a successful friendship is. And I think that this book does quite a bit to dispel that insistence that we have that like a good friendship means a friendship that lasts forever. And I think that this book is a really interesting argument that like that doesn't actually have to be true. I felt that pressure of like, oh, I am supposed to keep this friendship as long as I can. And if I don't keep it for the rest of my life, I failed. I'm bad at friendships. I failed this friendship. I let this friendship down. But I was noticing. I was like, you know, a lot of these people met me when I was in a different place in my life. I wasn't as healed. So maybe I was putting up with more crappy behavior. I was like more interested in somebody who was like super negative and kind of gossipy or something or was tolerating that for some reason. And now I don't want to be with somebody who's kind of mean and speaks poorly of a lot of people they they claim to love, like things like that. And But what do I do? Because friendship is this idea that you got to just stick it out and it's fine and it's whatever. And it's just know someone the longest. That's all. And in my head, I was like, well, does that make me bad if like this friendship really feels bad to me? I don't feel like this is meant to be a forever friendship and I want to let it go. But can you even do that? There's this pressure to make it look like we've never had a problem. We've always been friends. It's still really good. It's still as deep as it was. And I don't think that's true. And and reframing that not as a failure, but just being a little more honest so we're not all kind of lying to ourselves and lying to each other. One of the reasons why I was so attracted to this book is because, so I'm 33. I've had at least a 
a decade of like kind of the post college friendship situation where I feel like I've definitely had a few where I've gone through different levels of like friend breakups. And this is a section in the book, too, is that you talk about like, wait, 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 is this friendship actually the right size? And I think that when you don't consciously make adjustments to your relationships and what you're putting into it. You set yourself up for a situation in which you really overdo it and then it like ends in catastrophe. And so one of the things that I feel like I've been trying to teach myself, particularly over the last few years, and what spoke to me so much about this book is that if you don't overdo it, you can actually kind of just like turn the volume down a little bit on that friendship for a little while. And then when you're ready to turn the volume back up, that is much more possible than if you like fully get to the point where like there's some sort of blow up or there's some sort of like, no, I can't like stand you anymore. <laughs> like it'll actually be better for both of us if like we just put this on the back burner for a year. And then when I see you the next time, like I actually miss you and I want to talk to you and I want to catch up with you and I like can actually care instead of just focusing on all of these problems that have happened in our relationship. Like I think that that is where this whole idea of like taking stock of our friendship and kind of managing them in a way that is like slightly more active than what I think we've been told we have to do if it's like a real friendship. That was the (laughs) the lesson. (laughs) Yes, because it's this idea that like we don't have to, you know, I I talk about this in the book that we, with romantic relationships, we're like, it takes work. It takes work. You got to work at it. But with friendships, we're like, it's just so easy. We've just never had to work on it ever. And you shouldn't have to work on it. If And it's like, no, every relationship that we're going to have takes work. Because also, what is that saying? That friendships are supposed to be very surface level. And that is, you know, that's the message that that I know that I got where it was like, oh, friendships are supposed to just, they're not even that big of a deal. All, the biggest deal is is your romantic partner, you know, particularly for women. It's your husband. It's your husband. Your girlfriends are just a gab. Like, we're still kind of are doing these like 1950s extremely white versions of like what friendship should be. And it's not serving any of us. We need deep community. We need to be able to speak about our pain, our, our, our traumas, our problems. Like we've, we've come along in that way, but that, that's still very like buttoned up, horrible, like mad men friendship of just like, how are you today? Like I've never wanted that type of friendship. It's horrible. There are a lot of references to TV friendships and to these different I think that in pop culture, like there is a really, really strong like gendered divide between like guy friendships are just so often like hanging out with the bros, like totally chill. And like girl friendships are so frequently there's a range of portrayals, obviously, but then there's this like cattiness drama of all of these girl friendships. So I just wanted to ask about how much in like researching and thinking about this book, were you thinking about the difference between male friendships and female friendships? I know that all different sorts of of friendships can exist within this. But at the same time, what I really wanted to focus on in this book was how each gender is socialized to approach friendships. Because it's never going to be like, oh, men's friendships are like this. Of course it's not. The depictions of female friendships that I saw in movies and TV, and it really was either that, like, you talk to them every single day all the time. They run over with ice cream every single day. I've never had that. It sounds great. I want it. Um, I don't know if it exists. And then also the friendships where you're just kind of like, polite and I guess you like go out for drinks and you like kind of hate each other and it's like fine and it's so funny because even if you're as mindful as I am and so many of us are of the ways that we're socialized the ways that we're conditioned but you internalize it so deeply that sometimes no matter how much work you've done to kind of deconstruct it you realize like I look back and I'm like oh wow I really was friends with this person who was mean to me a lot and I just told myself well, sometimes female friends are mean to you. And I look back at that and I'm like, God, as smart as I was, as aware as I was of how toxic that is, how how much that wasn't what I wanted, some part of you still does have that feedback buried in your body. And you're not telling yourself like, they're mean to me, but it's fine. Like you're not having that conversation, but you are like letting it go by. I think that there's so much of that. And I never wanted to have a friendship where I kind of hated somebody or they kind of hated me. Like, why are we doing this? This is a free will thing. We don't have, we actually don't have to stay tethered to each other. If you secretly don't like me and you're undermining me or you're jealous or 
you want to stay friends with my abuser? Like, why are, what? You want to believe <laughs> that after high school, it gets easier and you have this sort of like, now nah, I don't take any shit. But like, that's not the truth of human emotions, especially when we've really been told that like, once you're friends with somebody, you kind of have to put up with whatever from them. I think that's the biggest thing to me that I see with women. I just want more for my my own friendships. I want more for other people's friendships, especially for women. I, I think it's so important that we are mindful of breaking out of that. And and again, letting that person go for their for both of you. We're going to take a break here, but if you want to hear more from Lane and myself on another topic, check out our Slate Plus segment, where today we're talking about celebrity friendships. And please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast, no hitting the paywall on the Slate site, and bonus content of shows like this one. To learn more, go to slate.com slash the waves plus. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. Personally, I have been in therapy on and off for a very long time, and I find it incredibly beneficial. It helps to just sometimes sit and unpack what's going on in my life. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Waves today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Waves. Tired of reading the same boring news stories? Listen to Crooked Media's Hysteria for unapologetically real and opinionated conversations about the news you need to hear. Every week, Hysteria, hosted by Aaron Ryan and Alyssa Mastromonaco, is leading the charge alongside a hilarious and relatable squad of bi-coastal women. With their fresh take on the political and cultural landscape, Hysteria is breaking down barricades and changing the game. Say goodbye to the male gaze and hello to smart, real, and refreshing content. Tune in for new episodes every Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to The Waves. I really loved and it was like in the first pages of the book, the kind of like list of like examples of like, here are ways to make friends. Here are different things that you can try to do. And I felt like I did that a lot. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it did not work. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your experiences of like trying to make friends. And now in particular, I'm sure that as this book comes out, everybody's going to be like, how do I do this? And I just wanted to ask you, what were your biggest struggles with making friends as an adult? How do you kind of keep on getting back on the horse? I think one of the things that I really struggled with in terms of making friends was wanting it to look the way I thought it was supposed to look, wanting it to unfold the way I thought it was supposed to unfold. You know, it's one of those things that when you're a kid and you meet someone and you're like, oh, we have so much in common, we're going to be friends. And then usually you just were. But as an adult, I've I've gotten very wary of like, oh, we have so much in common, we're going to be friends. And I'm like, calm down, Lane. You actually might not. You don't know, you know? And and sometimes, you know, that's a that's a big part of what I talk about it in in the book is like when I would meet someone and I'd be like, oh my gosh, like she really wants a friendship. I really want a friendship like this. Like, I think we have it. Like, what's going on? And then they're busy or they're not texting you as much as you're texting them, or you're the only one asking them to hang out. And none of these could mean you know, th- this could mean they're not interested not interested, or it could mean they are interested and they're just busy. Like you don't know. They're not necessarily bad signs, but just sometimes the disappointment 
and the feelings of rejection that I would feel were not necessarily because I was being rejected. It's just because I really craved that we met in this really cute way and then we wanted to become friends. And so we did. <laughs> like, But i that's just not often what happens. When I first moved to Charlottesville, my partner got me tickets to go see the Mountain Goats alone. And I was like, oh, my God, perfect. I love the Mountain Goats. Like, I'm just going to go to this concert. And it's in this small town. Like, it's not New York City. Like, I'm just going to stand there and like somebody will come up to me and like we will strike up a conversation. And like, this will be my first friend in this town. And I didn't speak to anyone at that show, (laughs) like because I like didn't know how to be vulnerable yet. And I didn't know how to be like. Maybe I'll talk to somebody for three minutes buying a beer and I will never talk to them again. And I can value that interaction. I hear it all the time. Just having the door open, um, wearing something that can start up a conversation, uh, something like that, where you have that in common. Um, You know, I think that's something that really gives a good reason to be that really cool dork wearing the band t-shirt to see the band, you know, like I've, I've had people meet cause they were both wearing like my t-shirts and stuff. And they're like, Oh, and they assumed like, Oh, if you love Lane's stuff, like you're probably like funny and cool and okay with big feelings. And they were, and then they became friends. And it's, I think that so much of it is taking that leap, whether it is, I'm going to go to this thing alone and I'm worried that I'm going to be judged. But what if something great happens? I'm going to walk up to this stranger or this person that I'm talking to already and start up a conversation and maybe it won't go anywhere, but maybe it will. Like having that openness, having that curiosity, so much of what I I wanted to impart is that you're not a failure if you don't have this yet. You're not a failure if you go to that bar and you don't take home five best friends. Like, It's just having that sort of openness and curiosity and that faith that it will happen when it's supposed to. Speaking of vulnerability, I actually wanted to read a section of the book and then talk about it. And I, when I was reading this, was like, oh, my God, I didn't even know that I needed somebody to say this, but I did so badly. I've seen some people say things like, your friends are not your therapist. And yes, it is important to make sure there is a reasonable expectation of emotional labor we can expect from friends depending on their comfort level, which you can only know by asking them what they can handle, what is out of their depth, and what space they can hold for you. That said, if they ask if you're okay, they should be prepared for you to say no and be prepared to hold space for the reason for that no. Again, it's so crucial that both people are feeling cared for and that no one is helping at the expense of their own mental and emotional well-being. But in the wrong hands, the phrase, your friends are not your therapist, could send the wrong message to someone in need. Similarly, it's not necessarily trauma dumping if you're asking someone to hold space for you and you've asked for their boundaries. It's sharing and reaching out for support. This is a bold thing to say. And like sometimes you can say your bold things in a book or in a podcast and not like just as one single tweet. But I wanted to ask you to tell me a little bit more about like how you came to this, how you feel about it. Is it like a thing that you're you're worried about or do you feel ready like people need to need to need to accept this? That feels absolutely right to me. You know, and, and when I was when I was writing it, I did second guess myself in that I was like, I wonder if this hits anybody else this way. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe people hear it and they know exactly what they mean. So I love hearing from people who are like, no, I always hated hearing that too. And the reason why it's so harmful is, look, if we lived in a society that freely encouraged us to open up about our our mental health challenges, our trauma, our the things that are deepest to us, our deepest pain, if we encouraged actual community and actual having a network of people, we don't encourage that at all. So I just don't like seeing any rhetoric that is going to further push someone away from reaching out for help. And then in this same chapter, I also talk about how many mental health crises that we have, how many people we lose to to suicide. And then we're like, they should have reached out. I don't really think that's fair. I really don't. I think that we need to be more proactive. And I also think that Maybe they should have reached out. Fine. If they should have reached out, then we need to actively cultivate a place where people feel safe enough to reach out. So I just, 
don't like seeing anything that someone might see in a time of need and a time of isolation and a time of crisis. And they're going, well, your friends aren't a therapist and I don't have a therapist because I can't find one. I can't afford one, whatever. But that's not a place to tell my friends I'm just going to struggle alone and watch it get worse. There are like so many layers of this, both in terms of like, I think it's so correct that like kind of pathologizing someone feeling lonely or whatever they're feeling into being like, oh, you need to bring this to a medical professional, I think is like really not a healthy way to build community overall. I think that it's true that like like I've helped friends like find a therapist like Psychology Today, love, love, love psychologytoday.com. It's the only place that I've ever successfully helped someone find a therapist. But like that doesn't mean that like, okay, now that person's solved and they can go over in that corner and like deal with their problems. But that's how we treat them. That's how we do like and and honestly, a lot of with a lot of people, you're lucky if they even help you do that, you know, and and the message that I got for so much of my life. And then was that like, you can't talk about that stuff. And so then you can face the very real fear, which is you, maybe you're too damaged or something to have friends. And I felt that for so long. I was like, oh, I guess I'm just like, I guess nobody else has problems. Nobody else has pain. Everybody else is just totally comfortable with this situation we have where it's like everything is at arm's length. And, you know, especially as a as a comedian, I, I realized at a young age that it was like, oh, people only wanted to talk to me when I was funny. People only wanted to talk to me when I was making them laugh, when it benefited them. But if I ever came in, I mean, I realized this as a child. If I ever came in and was like, Ugh, some rough stuff is going on, they were like, hmm, we don't, we don't, we don't want to talk about it. And I was like, wow, that does not feel like friendship. And I wish I could go back to child me and be like, hey, you're right. That's not friendship. It's really not. I just wanted to talk about with that idea of communication, the thing that I found so practically useful in this book is it's like actual dissection of boundaries. If we're talking about therapy speak, I think that boundaries are like a real therapy speak (laughs) term where like everyone's supposed to know what they mean somehow and know how to execute them. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, all that you need there is some boundaries. (laughs) It's kind of like, wait, what? how, how do I do that? Like, I know that I need a boundary, but I don't know what the boundary is. And I thought that one of the, like in terms of this book being very like, here is, I'm meeting you with advice that is on the ground. I felt like the place that I really needed to hear some of this was like, what you have to decide is how to create a boundary and then just actually be okay with living in that boundary. And I think that that's the thing where with friendships in particular, like you talk about the like whole catty girl idea of like the woman who seems to hate all of the rest of her friends. And like, I feel like this is something that I've learned occasionally in my working professional life that like nothing uh, bonds a group of people together more than like bitching about work or like, you know, being kind of like catty in that kind of way of like this shared experience that is bad or negative. So I think that to me, the thing that I find the hardest is to like decide, okay, I need a boundary. Here's what the boundary is. And like now I'm just going to be okay with this and I'm not going to let it bother me. And so I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit if you also share that feeling of like, okay, boundaries are talked about all the time as the solution, but what is a boundary and like what you feel like you've learned about boundaries in friendship since doing some of this work? It was so important to me to put in everything that I had learned about what boundaries are, how you set them, how you maintain them, how you deal with the resulting feelings, because I always get frustrated, again, with those people who make it sound really simple. It's just so frustrating to me. And and when it's somebody who's like never struggled with setting a boundary in their life, I actually don't want to hear from you about this topic. You know what I mean? I don't find it relatable when someone's like, this has always come easy to me. Here's how you do it. I'm like, irrelevant, irrelevant. If it's always been easy for, I want to hear from someone who's been, who's struggled with it. I want to hear from somebody who's on the ground floor of navigating this because that's where I'm coming from. That's what's interesting to me. So, um, you know, it's coming from a place of, I have struggled with people pleasing uh, so much in my life. I tend to be the friend who's giving more, who's taking care of people, who's like, you know, while while not always feeling taken care of, like I tend to struggle with that imbalance um, because I think people who don't struggle with that imbalance, I don't think they struggle with friendships in the same way. And, and I talk about that in the book as well, where it's like people who have an easy time setting boundaries and can, you know, cut people off, no problem, sometimes to a fault, often to a fault. They're not really going to struggle with that. I think it's those of us who 
you know, again, to bring it back to a, to a gendered thing, because I know that it, it heavily is where we're taught to just like be nice, nice, nice and empathize with like, oh, they're really treating me like crap, but maybe it's because of this. Like my brain, that's where my brain goes. And it has been a lifetime of work to try to remind myself that like, hey, if I am in a friendship where I'm constantly getting hurt and my boundaries are being violated and all these things, but I'm like making sure they're okay. Like, how about me? Why am I not making, like if they're not making sure I'm okay, then I have to make sure I'm okay. What I love about boundaries is that it allows you to take some of your power back. Well, Lane Moore, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. That's our show this week. The Waves is produced by Shayna Roth. Daisy Rosario is senior supervising producer. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different host, different topic, same time and place. Thank you so much for being a Slate Plus member. And since you're a member, you get this weekly segment. Today, Lane and I are going to talk about celebrity friendships. One of the references that you deploy a lot in the book that I think is a really shared common language, and I think in particular is a shared common language for friendship, is TV friendship relationships. So first, I just wanted to acknowledge that to some extent, I think TV friendships are like the predecessor of celebrity friendships. <laughs> like like TV friendships feel almost totally analogous. And in fact, there are a couple of examples here that I kind of want to talk about, which are both TV friendships and behind the scenes friendships. Like I think the canonical example is Sex and the City. It felt really sad not to have a man in my life who cares about me. No special guy to wish me happy birthday. No goddamn soulmates. And I don't even know if I believe in soulmates. Don't laugh at me, but maybe we could be each other's soulmates. And then we could let men be just these great, nice guys to have fun with. Well, That sounds like a plan. And I think it's super interesting, and you note this in the book, that like it was actually an in-real-life friend fracture that changes what happens in that situation. But I just first wanted to ask you, what do you think makes TV so special at being so good at depicting a certain type of friendship? You know, when I was a kid and I watched TV shows, I always assumed that they were writing about their friends. They were writing about what their friend group is like. The same way that when I would listen to love songs and stuff, I was like, oh, they're writing about their relationship and like how much they love their partner or whatever. As a musician, I've realized that even when like I've written songs about love or things like that, a lot of times what I'm writing about is what I wish my relationship was like, what I my ideal romantic relationship would be like. It's wish fulfillment a lot of the time. I would guarantee a lot of the pop songs about like, oh, I love you so much and it's always so perfect – was either written at the very beginning of a relationship or was written as something that you wish it was like that. And I think the same is true for friendships, where I think a lot of it is wish fulfillment and you're able to be like, wouldn't it be great if we could hang out all the time together? And it was pretty easy. Wouldn't it be great if we all lived in a geographical space or apartment building where it was actually just totally easy to hang out all the time? Wouldn't that be great? (laughs) Yeah, I talk a lot in the book about the show New Girl, which I've watched a million times. Like, I want to see them hanging out all the time. Even when (laughs) when Schmidt moves out, he's still there all the time. Schmidt and Cece literally have their own house and they still hang out all there. That literally would never happen, but they put it on the show because they know it's more fun to watch. That was just some of our Slate Plus segment. If you want to hear the whole thing, go to slate.com slash the waves plus to become a Slate Plus member today. Slate.com slash the waves plus.